Uh, my name is Richard Rangham. I'm from Harvard University, and I study chimpanzee society. And that makes me fascinated by differences and similarities between chimpanzee society and human society. And what I want to do this evening is think about uh, this in three different ways. Uh, I want to think about um, the special ways in which humans are different from uh, chimpanzees and other primates in terms of our tribalistic tendencies. I want to think about uh, how to understand that as an evolutionary package, where it came from, and, and why uh, that particular package evolved. And I'm going to be thinking in terms of the species as a whole. You know, we just heard these wonderful examples of how uh, tribalistic psychology plays itself out in different ways in different groups, in the Mayanga, uh, in uh, Botswana. Uh, here I'm thinking more about the species as a whole. And if I have a curious picture in this first slide of uh, some village stocks, it is to emphasize something that Polly talked about, which is the importance of adherence to social norms and the punishment that goes with it if you fail to adhere to the social norms. So I take um, tribalism in the form of a combination of in-group affiliation and out-group hostility to be a human universal. It's expressed uh, in different ways. It's shaped by culture, <laughs> very importantly. and. Um, Something very similar happens in primates. Uh, it's, it's very striking in chimpanzees. You certainly have strong in-group affiliation, particularly among the males. You have so certainly intense out-group hostility. In the case of chimpanzees, dramatically, uh, it uh, can lead to deaths, uh, where there are deliberate efforts by chimps to go off to the border and hunt and kill strangers. So uh, it seems to me that uh, it's pretty clear that there are deep evolutionary roots to tribalism. We see something similar in monkeys. So they stay in stable troops and, and attack members of neighboring groups. Uh, and and uh, in some, we have uh, killing like in, in chimps. But the, the thing about humans is that I think that we can point to ways in which the tendencies for tribalism are kind of exaggerated in some ways. And that is because we have this extraordinary intense uh, increase in the amount of tolerance and cooperation that we show within groups. So what I first of all want to do is to draw attention to three ways in which this is manifest. You could certainly go to others as well. But I want to focus on these because I think they help tell the evolutionary story in a tidy way. The first thing is little aggression. So if you read the newspapers, you know, you might be thinking, oh, well, you know, there's lots of knife stabbings or gun shootings or whatever it is. But if you take a chimp perspective, or actually most animal perspective, there's incredibly little in our society. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about states where large groups of strangers can come together and, and uh, crush up against each other without getting into a fight. Uh, or you can go to small scale societies like uh, hunters and gatherers, like these uh, Ache from Paraguay. Uh, who uh, Hill and Hurtado, who worked with them, uh, have this quote, that in 17 years, they never observed a scuffle between uh, Ache men. And actually, nowadays, uh, they've gone on much longer, and 43 years. If we compare, just by totting up, the frequency of fighting in human societies and in chimpanzee societies, the estimates that we have at the moment, when we compare with the most aggressive of human societies, which are uh, somewhat uh, disordered um, ex-hunter-gatherers now suffering from alcohol, uh, nevertheless, people are fighting at something like one thousandth of the rate of chimpanzees. It's an enormous difference. Congratulations, everybody. We are nice. <laughs> And further congratulations, I think, because uh, we do not have alpha males who achieve their position by fighting, personally fighting, every other male to be able to become the top guy. So in primates, that happens. If you want to be an alpha male chimpanzee, you have to get out there and personally, physically f defeat every other chimpanzee in the group. That doesn't happen in humans. On the one hand, you have in small-scale societies, uh, an egalitarian set of relationships among the adult males, and there is no alpha. You know, we are all captains, they say. And uh, then, of course, we come to modern society, where <laughs> you may be thinking that there are alphas, but happily, they are not alphas that are achieving their place by personally, physically fighting everybody else. It's all done through coalitions. 
And uh, I'll, I'll draw attention to the fact that this seems to be a really important uh, feature of humans. And then the third point I want to make is uh, about social conformity. Uh, we have emotions that uh, push us in the direction of tending to agree with groups. There's this fascinating example of group polarization, where people have done experiments with 3,000 people uh, in a sort of jury setting. And uh, what you see is this uh, characteristic shift of opinions to a more extreme group consensus. So the way the study is done is that uh, you, you bring in your jurors and you ask them individually before they go into uh, group discussions, what do you think of this case? And suppose they're asked to assess the guilt and suppose you find that the, there are some groups in which uh, the median of the scores is higher than the average. Okay, but by the time you get to the group consensus, it's a lot higher than the average. They all push each other in that direction. On the other hand, if they start out under the average, then they go even further under the average. So that's group polarization, one of many kinds of effects like this. You have moralistic aggression, where if somebody is not following the social norm, then, well, you can put them in the stocks, but uh, you can talk to them and, uh, and say, here's a white feather, uh, you know, we think you ought to be joining the army in the First World War. And then, uh, overall, uh, a perception on the way in which uh, moral attitudes to behavior uh, emerge uh, is summarized here by Jonathan Haidt, uh, saying it's, a lot of it is to avoid conflict. The first rule of life in a dense web of gossip is be careful what you do. You'd better be able to frame your actions in a positive light. This is pushing people towards doing the things that other people approve of. Now, I want to ask where these tendencies come from, the, the little aggression, the no-fighting alpha males, and the social conformity. And I'm going to suggest, now beginning the second part of my three-part talk, uh, that uh, biological self-domestication is the answer to what makes us such a peculiar, unaggressive species in the ways I've been talking about. And I'm going to suggest that it happened around the time that Alison was talking about when uh, she sees evidence for a change in society based on the archaeological record. In order to think about this, I want to divide the way in which we think about aggression into two. First of all, there is proactive aggression. You don't have to be emotionally involved to be proactively aggressive. You can just sit there quietly contemplating what you would like to do to X who has offended you in the past. And then you go out and you do it. So you don't have to have any kind of high arousal, but you do have to have a specific goal and a consistent target. Animals do this, humans do it. Uh, it's one kind of aggression that is supported in one particular kind of biological way in the brain. Another kind is reactive aggression, when you lose your temper. This is what happens when a man comes back and finds his wife in bed with another man. This is what happens when uh, somebody calls uh, your mother a rude name after you've been drinking in the bar. Uh, you are highly aroused, and uh, you want to go for that guy and uh, do something to him. And by the way, if other people try and uh, get in your way, you're going to thrash out and get at them as well. So reactive aggression is what I'm going to be talking about because we have wonderful experiments in which people have tried to take a wild animal, succeeded in taking a wild animal, and then chosen among the wild animal progeny those individuals that are particularly reduced in reactive aggression. So the way you do this, if you're thinking about doing it, is uh, uh, you take your young foxes or your young mink or whatever it is, and you walk towards them when they're babies, and then you write down the distance at which they say, ha! and the ones that let you get closest are the ones that you breed from, and those are the ones that have less reactive aggression. Well, the amazing thing of these experiments, as many of you, I'm sure, have come across, is that um, uh, when they were done, uh, starting in the 1950s in Russia by uh, Dmitry Belyev and his colleagues, they found that within just a few years, not only did they get animals that were greatly reduced in reactive aggression, that's fine, that's expected, but they also got things like white patches on their bodies and floppy ears. In other words, these odd additions to uh, the... Uh, selective effects against reactive aggression. So what this boils down to is that if you do that experiment with animals, you find that there are two ways that you get changes, biological changes over the generations. First of all, you get them in the way that you're looking for, the reduction in aggressiveness and fear and stress. 
And the second one is this weird c combination of all sorts of other things going on. So there's the white patches and floppy ears if you happen to be a species that has long ears and, uh, and colored fur. And then there are these other ones as well. And I want you to draw, uh, pay particular attention to the ones at the bottom, the reduction in body mass, face and teeth size, uh, sex differences, and, and brain size. Because lo and behold, some years ago, the archaeologist Helen Leach drew attention to the fact that these are the ways in which you recognize a domesticated animal as being distinct from a wild animal in the fossil record, and they are also characteristic of humans. In the human case, we have undergone brain reduction only relatively recently, but the other things have happened much earlier. It suggests that the relationship between a wolf and a dog is, is sim similar to the relationship between a pre-sapiens ancestor and homo sapiens. You see the first signs of this in uh, about 315,000 years ago in the specimens that uh, Alison referred to uh, from Jebel El Hood in, in Morocco. Uh, you see them uh, in uh, several ways, uh, reduced brow ridges and uh, shorter face and smaller teeth. And you can take some of these characteristics of uh, early humans at that time and see them changing as we become closer to the present. So look at uh, the facial width here. Uh, we get an increasingly uh, loss of uh, wide faces. Now hold on to your hats, you guys who have got white, wide faces in the audience, because I want to just focus on this, because it turns out that there is a correlation which is extraordinarily systematic between facial width and uh, the degree of aggressiveness. And there's a picture of hockey players up here because it's a wonderful way of assessing this uh, because the referee is not going to be paying attention to the breadth of your face. There's no possibility of bias here. But it turns out, as these graphs show for six professional hockey teams, that there is a tendency for men who have slightly wider faces to spend more minutes in the penalty box <laughs> for fighting. And it's true in college hockey teams too. Now, I, I like these graphs because they make a point that there is a little trend, but nevertheless, the trend is not very predictive. So that's why uh, those of us who have relatively wide faces need not be accused of necessarily being aggressive. There's lots of variation, as you see here. But nevertheless, there is a trend, and the trend is astonishingly consistent. Lots of people are doing these studies now. And you see here a whole list of ways in which the wide-faced men, the relatively wide-faced men, uh, are uh, more aggressive or, or antisocial and, oops, well, less attractive in some ways, I'm sure. You know, let, let's not get carried away here. Um, it's, and note that uh, there are primates, too, in which this has uh, been shown. So there's an astonishing relationship, a predictive relationship, that as the face becomes narrower, so uh, you can expect to have, on the whole, less aggressiveness. The bottom line of such studies, I think, indicates this, that human aggression is like that of a domesticated animal, extraordinarily suppressed in terms of reactive aggression. And human anatomy is like that of a domesticated animal. And so I want to make the case that humans actually are a domesticated animal. And then the question is, well, what do you mean by that, and how did that happen? So let's focus uh, on the, the three things that I, I drew attention to. Uh, the reduction of reactive aggression, the lack of uh, alpha male fighters, and the social conformity. And I want to draw attention in this uh, third part of the talk about thinking about how we could have become domesticated to a feature that I think is absolutely critical in a rather chilling way and that is, I'm calling it, selective coalitionary proactive aggression. It's a mouthful. Uh, what it means is that people can get together and decide in advance to kill somebody. So that might be through execution, it might be through assassination, it might through, be through a lynching. Uh, we've got uh, the death of Caesar on the left here and the death of the unfortunate Jordanian pilot from ISIS on the right. And just to take this apart, if we think about this characteristic, and the important thing about it is that humans do it, but no other species does, is that the proactive aggression, it's premeditated. The killing is initiated only if everyone decides we can do this without any risk to ourselves. The people who carried out all the murders in Auschwitz, they, they didn't get fought back against. They arranged it that way. So it's very low cost 
for the killers. And it's selective because the victims are selected in advance. And the only way you can do that, the only way that you can say to your pal, you know, that guy, Fred, I hope there are not too many Freds in the audience, uh, he's been behaving so aggressively. Don't you think it's time we did something about it? You have to be able to talk to be able to get an idea like that. So chimps can have coalitionary proactive aggression. They go off and kill members of neighboring groups, but they don't target in advance some member of their group. Now, we've heard a little bit from um, Polly and Alison about uh, hunters and gatherers being, uh, on the whole, very peaceful. And that is absolutely right. And of course, we've had, I think, 300,000 years of uh, selection in favor of reduced reactive aggression. But even now, if you survey the literature on hunters and gatherers, you will sometimes find that there are men who vi violate the social norms and who refuse to obey the ordinary uh, exhortations of good behavior. They try and take another man's wife by force. They try and take someone's food by force. And if someone resists, then that might lead to this guy, this bad guy, maybe attacking, maybe killing the somebody who gets into a conflict with him. And eventually, the society has a problem to deal with. And they'll start trying cajoling them, and they may ridicule them, they may sing songs of derision in their face, uh, they may try and ostracize them, shun them completely, they may even just pack up their bags and walk away in the middle of the night. But the hunters and gatherers, so then a guy knows how to find them. And in the end, what has to happen is execution which is known worldwide uh, in every continent in which hunter-gatherers occur. And it's, it's organized in, in a good way. Uh, so Christopher Bohm has this uh, quote here saying that it's organized to be done by typically the kinsmen uh, of the victim because that means that inhibits a cycle of, of revenge killings. Now, uh, this is at a time when we have already become uh, highly domesticated, I think. So, uh, if we think about the ways in which this has happened over their evolutionary past, I think we have to go back into the deep past to think about this in a serious way. There are lots of hypotheses out there for why it is that humans are cooperative and tolerant, and sometimes people speak directly about uh, a, a low aggressive species. And here are uh, many of them listed. Now, the point I worry about is this, that uh, many of these, these splendid ideas fail to deal with the problem of an incorrigibly aggressive male. So take female choice. Uh, people say, well, surely, you know, the, the, the choice exerted by women in saying who they want to marry and have children with is going to have a big effect on the course of uh, the kind of uh, psychology that males show, because they will prefer to choose males who are not so aggressive. Yeah, that's okay, but what happens if the male just doesn't pay any attention? And he rapes her, and he takes her from other men. And we've got to go back in time to think that that, that would have happened on a regular basis at a time when they were much more chimpanzee-like in their behavior, because that's the kind of thing that chimpanzees will do. There's an idea that weapons might have been a, a really significant advance in enabling people to conduct selective coalitionary proactive aggression, because it really helps to be able to organize uh, every, 10 men surround one uh, with their bows and arrows. But the thing about weapons is that it's pretty clear that weapons have gone on for being used by species of humans uh, long before Homo sapiens. So that's why it seems to me that, that language-based conspiracy is critical and that around 300,000 years ago, a little bit earlier, our linguistic abilities became sufficiently skilled to be able to develop conspiracies with all the complexity of trying to dodge blame and, uh, and uh, recruit allies uh, to be able to conduct safe killing of these previous alpha male tyrants with their big brow ridges and wide faces and unwillingness to be aggressive if we can trust the anatomy to tell us what was happening in the past. And there, from there, I think, uh, we would have got self-domestication because this would have selected against the reactive aggressors. And uh, the self-domestication would be associated with uh, the uh, emergence of coalitions of uh, egalitarian males. And these are coalitions that we, in many ways, I think, still see in our society today. 
Um, one of the benefits of all this is that you get lots more cooperation within the group because people who are trying to uh, push their way through conflict are sort of held back and uh, uh, ultimately executed, but of course very often simply uh, a word from the coalitional patriarchy will, will suffice. And I think that under the conditions in which in claustrophobic societies somebody who is the tall poppy uh, is in danger of being viewed as a witch, as an outsider, as ultimately the kind of person that's not good for society and therefore needs to be executed. Under those conditions, then there's going to be selection in favor of self-protective moral emotions where uh, there's a strong tendency to conform, ultimately, because of the fear of execution. So I think the special power of human tribalism is going to be rooted in the fact that we have this tremendous evolution of conformity associated with our reduced aggressiveness. On the one hand, uh, it's lovely that we have all of these strong group loyalties uh, and relatively uh, peaceful societies, you know, compared to chimpanzees. And, and by the way, bonobos too um, are almost as aggressive as chimpanzees in terms of the frequency with which they, they fight. And on the other hand, uh, you have the increased capacity for the groups uniting uh, in a very um, a conformist way in deciding who is an enemy and how to behave in relationship to them. So the key points I want to take you uh, to go away with are that um, uh, we are now a very unaggressive species compared to any other primate. And uh, for 300,000 years, it seems likely that we've had selection pressure against that if you look at our bones. The community pressures that apparently selected against reactive aggression would also have favored group conformity because it would be scary to be a non-conformist. And that, I think, has exaggerated our tribalistic psychology greatly through the evolution of new kinds of moral systems and moral emotions. Thank you very much. Thank you.